Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Select Committee on the Environment and Climate Change where we have a one-off session with the former Chairman of the Climate Change Committee, Lord Deben. Uh, we are delighted that you're here with us, John, and we look forward to exploring a number of issues, both about the institutions that govern our net zero ambitions and indeed the policies and the record of this government and where we need to go to achieve those goals that this government has set in the future. Can I say that this is a public session and will be recorded and will be available on uh, Parliament Live, that if any members have any uh, interest to declare to please do so before they ask any question. And a transcript will be taken and witnesses will be able to comment on that uh, in advance. So, um, without further ado, John, you've been in post, or you were in post for 11 years, which is something of a record among public bodies, um, which is an indication of just how uh, a series of governments thought you were doing a, a superb job. Um, I just thought we'd start by perhaps asking for some reflections on, over that time you'll have seen how, from the beginning when the Climate Change Committee was set up to where we are now, how the relationship has emerged between it uh, and government, both in terms of the changes to the role, the nature of the advice it gives, uh, and whether you have any reflections on whether the roles of the CCC and indeed the relationship between them and government are in the right place for where we need to be now. Well, thank you. I, I think First, we should remind ourselves that it's a parliamentary committee and we advise Parliament. And the advice of the government is through that, so to speak. Mm. And we're available to advise the opposition as much as the government. And indeed, I've had some very clear views about what the opposition should do in various ways and have always been available for that. So I think it's important because it is a unique position for a committee to be. It is not a departmental government uh, uh, committee. And I think the structure is remarkably good. I mean, it, it is remarkably uh, resilient to all those years since its, uh, since its inception. Um, because its independence is guaranteed, it uh, makes its advice to Parliament. Parliament, when it passes the budgets, which we have to produce, uh, they then become law and they can't be changed without reference to the Climate Change Committee, which would have to give permission were it to be changed. And of course, that's the crucial bit of this, is that we can't put off decision making because there's a, an inconvenient by-election or general election. And the timing is also in the act in a remarkable way, so that every June we have to report on how far the government has met its statutory responsibilities and the advice that we've given it, and we can't put it off. So again, you, you, you are properly caught in having to do that, and the government can't ask us to put it off. And then the government has to respond in October and again, it has to do it in October. Um, and this is, a, 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 I think, earnest of the very clear way in which the whole structure has taken place. And I have to say, I don't think that um, I would have any serious alterations in it from my experience, except one. And it's not because it has ever gone wrong, but the one way in which you could... Uh, uh, still the voice of the Climate Change Committee would be not to give it any money. And uh, I've always thought that the one thing that we should have done was to make it uh, paid for like the, um, uh, the very important uh, Auditor General, uh, where you have an independent provision of that. Now, I, I have no complaint of any government in the terms of being able, of course, we're pressed to be as uh, uh, lean as we can be. And I think we are very lean. Uh, but I, I think it was a pity that that one thing that we didn't do, and certainly we have advised the <coughs> many countries now, I think the 14 or 15 who have followed us um, uh, to do that. The interesting thing is that we are still the most independent of any of the climate change committees around the, the, the world. It is interesting to see that we have been prepared in Britain to respect the fundamental issue, which is that the democratic 
um, uh, demand is that you have regular refreshment of the democratic mandate. The climate change demand is that you have a continuing and uh, absolutely determined battle to be fought. And that is why this mix is so remarkable. The democracy is served because Parliament has to agree or not agree to the budgets. The long-term needs are uh, 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 reflected by the fact that the, there can be no change without either repealing the Act or, of course, uh, the Climate Change Committee agreeing. And I, I can imagine circumstances in which the Climate Change Committee would feel it right to agree, but I haven't yet come to one of those. And there have been the odd occasions in which I've had to remind the government that if they tried to do these things without our agreement, then they would find somebody would take them to court and I would be first witness for the prosecution. And I thought that would be embarrassing for both of us, so would we please not get into that decision? Thank you. And if Baroness Boycott wanted to come in on this. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, it, it's great that you have that degree of independence. I, suppose, I just wanted to ask you, what difference does it make as to who is the occupant of number 10? Picking up on what Zach Goldsmith said in his letter, the fact that today there's the leak about the withdrawal of the uh, contribution to the Global Finance Fund. I mean, and we we had a meeting. I declare my interest as vice chair of Pierce Planet. I mean, we had a meeting with Pierce Planet the other day about trying to talk about how one ramps things up, and the very much prevailing opinion at the end of it was that you had to have a prime minister who was seriously engaged in this issue so that it really did get across <coughs> departments. <coughs> What's your outgoing view on that? Because you've obviously served a number of prime ministers in your time. Well, I'm rather against getting into personalities, and I've never done that as, thing, uh, as, as the chairman of the Climate Change Committee. Um, you need, I much prefer to talk about a government. I, I can think of some governments where the prime minister hasn't been all that engagement the government has been, and I think you can have it the other way around. So I, I, I mean, I really do think that it isn't that. Um, and uh, I would much prefer to concentrate on the fact that whereas last year uh, we were doubtful about the government having a plan to reach net zero, uh, the courts then, because of the Climate Change Act, forced the government to produce 3,000 pages explaining how it was going to get there. And when we read the 3,000 pages, which, by the way, we were not given beforehand, we had to do it afterwards. So I refused to make any comment because I don't comment unless I know. And we spent a lot of time looking at it. We've had the best people in the world, really, to look at this. And we've come to the conclusion that actually, having explained what it is that they intend to do, they're even less likely to reach this uh, uh, commitment, which is a legal commitment. And, and that's why we were so strong yes. about it. Now, I don't think it's for the Climate Change Committee to tell the government what mechanisms it's going to use to do it. What we have to do is to, we can recommend mechanisms, we can recommend the course of action, and we can say which actions are absolutely necessary. But if you're going to get this, keep this balance between us setting the budgets, us setting the targets, us helping people to go on the right route, and Parliament making its decisions about the individual um, matters, then I think we're much better to keep to that division, which is why I've always fought against mission creep. And a good example of that is, is airports. We have made it clear that there is a, an envelope for the aviation industry in terms of its emissions, mm -hmm. outside which it cannot go. It is not for us to say you can expand Bristol, but you retract Manchester. That is not for us to do. But it is for us to say to the government, you cannot allow the total to go beyond that. So we are able to say the government has got to have an airports policy. It's got actually to tell. Otherwise, every airport wants to expand and they all think they can on the basis that some other airport won't. And that is not a matter for us. That is a matter for the government. And I'm keen on doing that, which is why I really have never commented on 
the Prime Minister in any circumstances, or indeed the leader of the opposition. Because I very often have to say about the opposition that I'd like a bit more clarity in what they want to do. I'd like to know much more clearly because I think that's more likely to get the government to do what it mm -hmm. ought to do, which is why I welcomed the statement on uh, oil um, and was sad up to then that we hadn't had it because I didn't think it made the government able to, uh, uh, made the opposition able to, to do what it ought to do, which is to keep the government's feet <coughs> to the fire. Thank you. Thank you. Duncan. I want to um, <clears throat> take you back, if I can, to 2015 in Paris, when there seemed great optimism and hope the world had come together and agreed, rather unexpectedly, to adopt what were quite far-reaching, ambitious targets. Has the mood music changed since then? Because I'm, I'm aware, and I don't wish you to comment on individuals, of course, but as you look across the channel, you see uh, some of the continental parties there becoming much more alert to cost of living rather than perhaps the net zero question. Uh, the same issues coming through in the democracies of the West. I'm wondering, are you perhaps less optimistic now than you would have been in the aftermath of Paris when people were dancing on the tables? Well, no, I'm not actually less optimistic um, because against what you have just said, one has to balance the fact that the United States is now fully engaged, that the European Union has got a much better green plan than it certainly had then, that China has just made a series of commitments of a kind we would never have thought that it would do. Um, and that the truth is that we've got an Australian uh, government which at long last has actually seen that climate change is happening and is doing things about it. The New Zealand Prime Minister was over here recently and I had a meeting with him. They, they, he puts climate change as the top of his list of things to do. So I really do think that round the world this has improved enormously. I think that's one of the reasons that in our report we pointed out not only that the government would not reach the point that it has committed itself to legally and internationally, <coughs> but it's also enabling the United Kingdom, that's the right word, to fall behind. Instead of being the leader, we are now behind. And the trouble with that is that it is financially and economically and uh, uh, as, as far as our, our whole business world, very damaging because people will be investing elsewhere. Um, it's rather like when you talk about onshore wind. I mean, what on earth a Conservative government is doing making it impossible for people who want to have an onshore wind turbine not to have it because generally they shouldn't have it. The fact is, unless we make the change pretty quickly, there won't be the turbines available for what we need. So we, we've got to recognise that there is now a competition of a kind which we didn't believe possible in uh, at the time of, um, uh, of Paris. And we, of course, have led that. That was what our great achievements at Glasgow were, was to lead that that much further, which is why we are disappointed that we haven't built on that and haven't, for example, had the expansion of onshore and offshore wind and photovoltaics. And I never understand this because if you want to fight the climate, if you want to fight the cost of living um, uh, mm. crisis, then surely we ought to be producing more and more energy in the cheapest way possible, rather than wittering on about expensive ways to produce uh, uh, and generate electricity. I, I should have declared I'm a president of the Decentralised Energy Association, and I'm going to be going to host their lunch in a few minutes, so I'll have to leave early, so forgive me. <laughs> I've, I've, got no I've got my question out. Thank you. Lord Grant, see you wanted to come in. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the machinery of government has recently been reset, and your committee has been critical that coordination across government departments has been disappointing. I've always thought that adaptation has been the poor relation, if you understand my meaning in the issues government have needed to face up to and that is it meaningful or critical that adaptation has been split off and made the responsibility of DEFRA rather than BEERS a, a department you've been most critical of and furthermore it seems even less clear to me why responsibility for the, e, e, for the UK ETS has also been made a part of DEFRA's responsibilities. Yeah. Has this split in responsibilities for climate change been counterproductive? Well, it's lasted for a long time. First of all, let's realise this is not uh, the result of this recent reorganisation. DEFRA has always been responsible for adaptation. 
Um, and of course, adaptation <coughs> has been differently dealt with in the Climate Change Act. First of all, there is a statutory adaptation committee, of which there is a separate chairman, um, who doesn't actually sit on the main now because she's unable to because of her outside interests. So she doesn't sit on the main committee, but they have representatives and we interact these. And I have to say that we now operate the two together because you really can't deal with either without dealing with the other. And we operate very, very closely. Uh, but it's useful having an adaptation committee which has a wider membership uh, uh, compared with the, the main committee. Um, as far as DEFRA is concerned, I'm afraid DEFRA, um, I do have to say, um, is a department which doesn't have a proper programme to reach net zero by, by 2050. Um, this is remarkable, given its role, um, and somewhat surprising. But then we have had rather a curious relationship with this department for a time. We've, we've had ministers who didn't believe in climate change. Well, I found it rather difficult to deal with those. But the fact of the matter is we, we, we have this situation. I don't the, 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 I declare an interest in the sense that the present uh, Secretary of State is my successor as the Member of Parliament to Suffolk Coastal. So um, I have some uh, connection. The, the, the fact is she has, put, she has put into the department a degree of... Um, um, of organisation, which I hadn't seen before. So that is a great advantage. But the, the truth is that adaptation is not treated as seriously as mitigation, partly <coughs> because of the way the Climate Change Act has been written. Um, there is no... Uh, there is no role for us to say what the target should be. There is no uh, statutory position in that sense. So we're going uh, to have the, every five years, the government has to produce a, uh, uh, an adaptation uh, report, and we're expecting one now. Uh, we're way behind on it. And I think the government's got to be very careful about this because people, you know, we, we worry about uh, the issue of um, uh, people's concern about climate change, but it is growing all the time because people are feeling it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the witheringly hot summer last year made a huge difference. You can't avoid that. Uh, 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 we have now had the, the hottest June in history. And the hottest, that, uh, and that was a, true of 74 countries. And mm -hmm. we've now had the hottest day in history. These are very, very serious things, but they have a real effect upon the public. Because if you have a flood somewhere, people tend to forget it if it wasn't their flood. But if everyone experiences this very, very hot weather, know that people have been very much damaged by it, and then begin to find that drought is a real issue. Now, where I live in Suffolk, just beyond where I live, the Essex and Suffolk Water Company has said that it can make no new commercial connections until 2032. That is a direct effect on the economy of this country. All over the southeast, we are in that difficulty, but in the east, we are particularly, we are now officially designated as a semi arid area. There is an article which I haven't read because I don't uh, subscribe to the Daily Telegraph, but there is an article I see where I read the first three sentences about drought and who's responsible. Well, clearly, the people who are responsible, the government, because we, we've known we're going to have this for years and years and years, and yet we haven't built the necessary um, infrastructure. We haven't helped people to use less water. We have done nothing to rebalance the water payments so that you can pay very little for family needs, mm. but pay much more for other additional needs. We've done none of those things, and as a result, we're going to have real trouble. Now, I don't know whether Southeast Water is an efficient company or not. All I know is that there are people in Southeast Water area who haven't been able to have drinking water. Mm -hmm. Now, this is... This is in June. So if we have months to come. So I do think that your point is very real, but I don't think it's, 
I don't think it's a departmental point. I think it's just the fact the government hasn't created the, the circumstances in which we are taking adaptation seriously. And they ought to be very worried about it because this is where people are going to really complain because if you don't get your own water, if the floods come down your streets because people haven't planted trees in the higher lands so to stop the flood, if, if that happens, the, the government will be, will be blamed very directly. It will be more an issue of budgets and priorities. Saying, I think. Well, I mean, you've got to look at budgets in that sense. The government has been very sensible about uh, funding for future flood events, but it has not been sensible about the improvement and, and uh, repair of the present flood uh, uh, defences. So we have this rather curious position that we will be building seriously new defences, but some of the old ones are in significant danger of, of breaking under the weight. Thank you. Lord Whitty. Um, yes, um, first of all, could I, for someone who was very sceptical when you were first appointed, uh, I uh, rapidly was converted to uh, the feeling that you're doing a great job and you've done a great job for 11 years and uh, I, I think a lot of us who were doubtful to start with have been deeply impressed by that so well done Thank you. Um, you say you're still an optimist but of course the, the last report of the uh, committee which you must have signed off yourself expressed quite explicitly that they no longer had so much confidence in the government meeting the target you agree with the targets and you praise the government for setting those targets and the, I, I, that does give us a framework, but the confidence in meeting that, those targets has fallen, you say, in the committee say. Uh, and it, you particularly pick out, for example, uh, home insulation and uh, home heating, and which the, this committee has looked at, uh, and also behaviour change. Um, how confident are you really that we can meet the targets? Well, first of all, there is a sentence which I'm very keen on reminding you of, which says that it is not too late for the government to put it right. And it isn't too late, but it mustn't wait till the next general election. It's got to do it now. Because every... Uh, this is why I feel very strongly about the delayers, who are sometimes deniers and sometimes just would like to put things off. But the trouble with the delayers is that they make everything more expensive and they also make everything more touch and go. Uh, any sensible business would have started much earlier and done it much more effectively. I keep on realising that what I'm actually saying, and this may, may hurt you, Lord Whitty, but um, uh, uh, are sensible conservative views. You, if you're running, if you've got a problem, first of all, you define it, then you measure it, and then you recognise it, and then you set in, in a process a mechanism for solving it. What you don't do is to say, oh, well, it's all very difficult, and uh, my goodness me, um, it's going to be very expensive. The alternative of not dealing with it is much, much more expensive. And why I'm confident, actually, is that climate change will force people to do the right thing. The trouble is, by the time it does that, it will be much more expensive and much more touch and go. And I do say to individuals all the time, when I meet businessmen and such like, and they tell me what they're doing in the business and the rest of it, I always end, at least, by saying to them, and what are you personally doing? Because it's you that your children will say, what did you do to stop this world being in the disastrous position in which it was? So uh, I am very determined to bring home to all of us that we all have an individual issue as well as the corporate one. But I do believe that we will do it. It'll be a last minute thing, Mrs Thatcher used to say, you know, we are an 11th hour nation, an 11th hour world, but she was absolutely right in her understanding that we had to deal with it. Doing it at the last minute, as it were, is actually more expensive and more difficult. Hugely. And the, the shape of the curve is important. Um, you rightly said earlier that uh, it wasn't that important that Britain was being caught up by other nations. Uh, and that must be right. It's very important that the United States has taken a new view uh, and, and other countries. But 
Uh, so where Britain stands in the league table is not important. But do, are you worried that the world is falling behind in terms of its commitments and its actual policies to meet that? Well, I think it does matter where Britain is, because Britain has actually led the world. I mean, many of the changes in the world have happened because we set an example. And therefore, to cease to set an example is, in my view, a great disappointment. Of course, and I shall say this because there's no point, I know some people here don't agree with it, but leaving the European Union was a dereliction of duty because what it meant was that we no longer have the influence which we once had. I think that's morally wrong, actually. I think our duty on this earth is to use our influence and gain influence rather than back out of it. So, of course, we have put ourselves into a less powerful position, but we showed at uh, uh, Glasgow that we could still lead the world in those circumstances and that's what we should be doing it's it is important but you're quite right we can't do it all on our own but I do have more confidence today when you look at what the Americans have done when you look at what the European Union is now doing when you look at what um, uh, China is doing when you look at what South uh, Korea is doing I mean you go around the world and you see places where it really has changed and in most of those cases it has changed because climate change is clearly happening. The Chinese are in real trouble and they know it and therefore they have taken steps which they might otherwise not done. So in that sense I am optimistic but I just want us to, I just want us to do it sensibly, do it in a in a businesslike manner because it's not only cheaper but it's what we need for our own future, because we won't have an economy unless it's a new economy based upon green issues, because people won't buy our goods unless we do that. So firstly, secondly, if, if we want to fight the cost of living crisis, having cheaper energy is surely absolutely central. Having houses that don't need so much energy, which are warm and comfortable, which are not killing people in the summer, surely that's what you have to do for, for the reasons of, of, of cost of living. If you're worried about energy security, surely you need to have more of your own wind and sun and light uh, rather than relying on others. I, I, I don't see why people don't see that as the package which we are supposed to be dealing with. So you, even if they don't like climate change, even they wish it go away, these are the things that we should be doing as a nation. Give it, Lord Bruce. Hmm. Um, I uh, campaigned for renewable energy 40 years ago. Um, I supported the parliamentary move to impose targets against the will of the government of the day. I absolutely accept that climate change is real, and your nine key messages I agree with. But I do have a problem because... There's going to be a but, I know. Well, there is a but. Well, the, <laughs> but, the but is, you've just said, why wouldn't you use your own resources? But you're quite specific about the resources you want no. to use and the resources you don't want to use. So every scenario you can project to achieve net zero, and even net zero itself, involves... A, a declining amount of fossil yeah. fuels. But you said licensing fossil fuels in that from now on is wrong. Uh, I want to know how we are going to fill that gap if we abandon our own sources of fossil fuels. Um, and, and if I can just give you a couple of figures that have come out this week. Um, well, one is just a summary. Last year, the oil and gas industry in the UK generated 28 billion for the economy, 215,000 jobs and we imported £117 billion pounds of oil and gas. It's a declining industry, declining supply. Uh, everybody knows that. New licences are not to increase it, which is why I agree with your... Um, where it says expansion of fuel production is not um, in line with net zero. I agree with that. But it's not about expanding. It's about slowing the decline to match the transition. And the final point, and I'm sorry to say this, the industry itself, especially the supply chain, are increasingly investing in alternative renewable green energies. Um, and they won't be able to do it if they're rapidly shut down. So the point is, why can't we manage that transition, as you put it, in a common sense, conservative way? Well, um, first of all, we could have a discussion about how much oil we will need, how much the industry is producing. Uh, but that would take a long time and we would be swapping figures and I don't want therefore to have the argument on that basis although I 
don't agree that we need it in the way that you say. But leaving that aside, the first thing is the Climate Change Committee perfectly rightly said in response to the Iraq, the um, uh, Ukraine war, in response to Putin's invasion, it was perfectly proper for the government to seek to have as much uh, of gas, particularly from the resources that we have. I'm talking about the idea of um, uh, oil in 10 years' time. I just have to say, in 10 years' time, we'll either have failed entirely to do anything about climate change, which I don't believe will have happened, or the nation or the world will be on a trajectory of re declining use of oil. Mm. We will be able to buy oil from all sorts of people who are already producing it. So you have to say to yourself, how do you tell uh, countries in Africa that they shouldn't start using new oil resources if you are starting using new oil resources yourself? How do you do that? Well, then you excuse that by saying, well, it's British. Well, the point about that is that it's still the same price and it's still sold on the work market unless you nationalise it. And my view is that you, if, you've, if you're trying to lead the world, you ought to listen to the International um, Energy Agency in its absolutely clear advice that we cannot go on uh, increasing the sources of oil. And Britain should be the country that says, because we're in the ideal position of saying it, we have resources, we know how much we're going to need in the, in the 2030s, and that's why I don't want to get into the argument, because, it, 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 I mean, if you were right, then there'd be a different argument, but uh, we know what we need in the 2030s, we're going to have a wide range of people to buy from. So then they say, oh, well, we don't want to rely upon regimes we don't like. We've blooming well relied on regimes that we don't like for the last hundred years. And the point is, there's a wide range of regimes we don't like, so we will certainly be able to buy it. So the difference between us, Lord Bruce, is very simple, is I don't believe that we will need that energy additions. I don't think we should be led astray onto the old business of oil. We should be using our efforts and our money to do what we haven't done, which is to expand uh, our renewables, to find the new jobs there, to make it possible for as much of that as possible to go to those areas now reliant on oil. Last thing is this. We said that if you are going to bring more gas or oil out, we should be doing it in the most, in the most environmentally efficient way. We're not. Other countries, particularly Norway, are doing it more efficiently. Our oil and gas industry has refused to do what we asked them to do. And until they are prepared to do that minimum thing, which is to produce our oil and gas in the most environmentally friendly way, I find it very difficult to take seriously the figures and the arguments they put forward. And I have had this direct argument with the chairman of one of the major companies, and I have to say, I didn't find the response anything like what I had hoped for. The industry has got to teach people that it really does believe in, uh, um, in, in the proper movement from where it is to where it has to be. And if I may say so, I've been a real campaigner for against um, against disinvestment because these industries have got to change and that costs money. But I have to say, recent statements by Shell and BP make it very difficult for people to continue investments when they seem to be rowing back on their very point. So I just think we have a role in the world. We've made a huge difference. This is something we could have done and we didn't.
just but on, on two points. I mean, one is we have the, the biggest balance of payments deficit in our history, and you're saying we should actually increase that by importing instead of producing our own. I just feel economically you were keen about the domestic economy. We're it's not billions, we're going to import less. But, but it's billions of pounds. Yes, but it's we're a going declining to import industry less. anyway. We're going to import more regardless. And the second point is you mentioned Norway. Norway has made it absolutely clear they are throughout transition going to produce every commercial litre and oil and gas in their sector. And I think, uh, obviously, I, have a, I don't have any vested interests, but living as I do in the northeast of Scotland, having represented it and known it for over 50 years, people there who delivered a huge amount for the country over 50 years see people like you saying, your jobs are going to end, and fast, and the investment is already leaving. 90% of the operators have now said they're taking their investment out of the country. Redundancies are happening today, and what you're saying isn't being very well received. And you, you did say you advised the leader of the opposition. I can just advise you that the former Lord Provost, former leader of Aberdeen City Council, a Labour councillor, a Labour member of 35 years standing, sitting councillor, resigned from the Labour Party in protest because he says they don't understand that transition requires the industry to have an orderly transition, not a rapid shutdown, which is what limiting licences would deliver. Well, Lord Bruce, I don't believe that that's what limiting the, li the licensing means. I would remind you what Lord Whitty said kindly about me, and it is not going to change my mind on the facts because you tell me some people don't like it, because my job is to say what I believe to be right. We are not going to save the world from its destruction unless we set an example. That means we cannot allow further development of oil. And you cannot ask other people to do it and say, but we are going to uh, increase it because it's good for our... We're not increasing balance of it. Well, that is what... its decline. Well, no, that they would say the same thing. The fact is, we are going to increase it over what it would be if we allow the decline to be at the speed. And it is not fair for you to say that we're, this is a rapid and disgrace. But it is not. The decline which we had seen was measurable against the needs which we have, the changes which we need to make, we need to make immediately. And the real issue, I think, Lord Bruce, you should be doing is saying to the government, you have got to make this move easier for people by ensuring that there are the jobs in the places you're talking about. And that is the thing this government is not thinking through. It is the complaint you would have against Mrs. Thatcher, who made the right decisions about declining industries, but didn't make the right decisions about what you put in their place. And we've got to learn to do that. Oh, sorry, um, no, 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 Malcolm, 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 no. It is not the place of select committee members to offer advice to witnesses. Our job is to give advice to the government. I would remind that for all members. Peter. Can I follow on a bit uh, from what Mark was saying? Um, the sensible way to reach net zero is to phase out demand for fuels, for fossil fuels. That is what you are statutorily obliged to uh, advise on. It's not about restricting the supply of fossil fuels. There's no duty on you to advise on that or legal uh, obligation to do so. If uh, oil companies choose to produce more oil than is needed because of the declining supply, they will lose money. That's their problem, needn't worry us. If uh, we stop them producing oil, which would be a bizarre thing to do when we're allowing ourselves to import it from other countries, then other people will replace that supply, both at home and abroad. But more importantly, if we, the whole world, were to stop, were to reduce the supply of oil and gas faster than we reduce demand, there will be shortages, price rises, huge profits for the oil industry. We will have done to ourselves what Putin did to us last year. Is that the logic of what you propose? No, it isn't the logic, and that's why I didn't say that. First of all, Lord Lilly, I have you to... You only want us no, to stop... No, I, I, will, I will, if I may, I will explain yet again what I said. The world is producing oil sufficient to meet our needs. Our needs will increasingly decline. 
There are many countries in the world which will still be producing oil and who have no intention of reducing that. There are other countries which could produce oil and have got to make a choice, oil and gas, got to make a choice between going down that route and going down the route of renewables. We have a duty to try to get them to make the right decision because otherwise we are destroying our world and ourselves. Now you are quite right, Lord Lilly, that we should be, above all things, reducing our need for fossil fuels. But you personally have not helped us on that. On every issue that we have raised, you have actually tried to hold it up. So it is no good using this excuse as a means of saying what you really mean, which is that you don't believe that climate change is threatening the world, and you are therefore willing to be a delayer. Now, we have to get other countries to do the right thing because it affects our world, and it's our lives. It's the future of our children. And if you say to a country which doesn't have oil, you have a chance to produce oil and your future will be with oil, then I'm afraid they won't go for renewables, even though that is the real answer. So we have to do two things. One is we have to help them to go to renewables and cut out the in-between dirty thing. Ourselves have got to set an example of that. And all we need to do is to say that we will have the what is really a gentle decline in what uh, we are producing and we will go on with that and we are cost our balance of payments will in fact decline the the problems with it will decline but we are not going to turbocharge the increase in oil and gas production but particularly oil as a matter of fact thank you Ernest Bray. thank you um I'm a bit concerned about the kind of slightly negative tone, I think, that you take, Lord Governor, on some of these things. And I think that the public need to be a little bit more encouraged by some more positive news about how we're doing so that they can actually feel that they are contributing something that's actually working. And if I can just draw your attention to a report, I don't know whether you saw it or not, but it was at, just at the end of the year uh, by the Times Environment editor, Adam Vaughan. Yes. And it was a, a splendidly positive uh, look at where we are on all matters environmental. And it's called Six Reasons to be Positive. Yep. Uh, did you see that piece? I read it. <laughs> yes, right. Okay. okay, good. Well, then I was very struck by two things. Firstly, that it shows that actually the UK is doing rather well um, at, at, at uh, reducing its emissions faster, the report says, than most other rich countries. And I think that the most interesting fact that it showed was a graph produced by the Global Carbon Project which showed that we have, in this country, in the UK, reduced our emissions to around the 1857 level, which I think is fantastically impressive. Now, my friend Rosie here did suggest that it might be that we are sending our steel to be manufactured in other places, which uh, is a kind of slightly cynical way of getting to, to where we want to be, but I, I don't know. But it seemed to me that that is all good news. And why is it that we don't hear more about the good stories? Because frankly, if we continue to bombard people and berate them because they're not doing enough or that they might have harboured the wrong ideas, I think we switch them off in the end. Whereas I think what we want to do is to try and be a little bit more encouraging. And yes, talk about good success stories in the UK, even when it does mean that our former friends in the EU, or they are still our friends, but our former member ship partners in the EU, uh, we're doing rather better than them on some of this stuff. Why don't we continue to say that if it happens to be the truth? Well, I'm saying it all the time, but the fact is this is a past thing. We have done that. We've done it by the brilliant uh, change in our re to renewable energy. Um, and one has to say that the hero of that was George Osborne, because if he had not done about offshore wind what he did, we would not actually be there. It is a huge success. But the issue is we are now flatlining. That is what we have done. Now, I go well, around... The, well, since the end of the year, because this report came out towards the end of the year. So it's, yes, it's, it's, but, but if you look at what the figures come from, the work has all been done in the past. What we, have to, we are told as a committee not to look back, but to look forward as to what the present policies will deliver. And the problem is this. 
I'm all for being as optimistic as possible. Indeed, I was criticised by uh, uh, by Lord Duncan and others for being too optimistic. I am totally optimistic, and I constantly use these examples. The problem is that this government, at this time, is not doing the things to keep that movement going. I entirely agree with his uh, 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 explanation and statement, and we ought to say it all the time, and I do, and if you come to any of my meetings, you'll be, but you'll hear me first of all say how well we've done. The problem is this, and he doesn't cover this, the things that we have been successful with are things which have not actually included and asked things of the public. They're things which you've done administratively and effectively in that way. The issue is that you have to help the public see that we're not um, trying to have a miserable world. I'm not a member of Greenpeace. I'm not a Puritan. I don't want us to be colder and I don't want us to travel less. What I want us to recognise is that we are building a, glean, a greener and a cleaner and a kinder world by doing what we're doing. But the one thing that he has missed out, for example, is the appalling effect that we've had, for example, on biodiversity. We have lost more biodiversity in this country than any other country in the world. That has a real effect on climate change um, effects. And although we're now beginning, and, and you can see it yourself, when you drove 20 years ago, you were very young, when you drove 20 years ago, um, you would finish a journey and you would have to clean your windscreen because of the insects. You don't have to do that now because those insects are not there. It's just an example of what, what we have done. Our, our soils are less productive today than they have ever been. Uh, we have done terrible things to this. And if you are concerned to see it, I, I, may I recommend something which you think be very surprising. It's very short, 60 pages. It's called Laudato Si. It's the Pope's statement about this. It is worth reading whatever <coughs> religion you have because it puts very clearly the interconnection between climate change, which is the, which is the symptom of what we have done to the world and what we have done to the world. And so my problem is all the time to keep this balance of being very optimistic about what we have done and what we can do, but serious about where we are. And that's my problem. And when you write this report, it is supposed, and, and Lord Lily reminded me of the statutory requirement, our requirement is to measure where the government is, not where it was, if you see what I mean. And that's what we have to do. So inevitably, it will point to those things uh, amongst others that are good. I mean, for example, we've done much better on uh, electric vehicles than either the government or ourselves thought would happen. It's going much better. We've done much worse on connections, and some councils have been appalling, so that you can't actually have an electric car in some councils because they really don't have any public arrangement. And we've got to think about um, the way in which we, for example, benefit the rich and not the poor. I mean, if you have a drive, you can have your own plug. Um, if you don't have that, then the, the the, you have to rely on public plugs, and we charge them VAT if you do that, but they don't charge me VAT in my drive. And, and these are things which I have to say, it's not because I'm not optimistic. It's the tone, I think, sometimes. It well, the, if, I think you'll find the tone, if you reread the report, in the minds of what we have just said, I think you'll find the tone is about the fact they can do it if they'd only get on with it. I, and I ought to say one thing. All governments, in any circumstances, are much better at policy than they are at delivery. This is the nature of government. So sometimes I have to remind people it's not about climate change, it's just about government. They find it very difficult to deliver. Can I ask you to say a little bit more about the issue you just touched on, which was the fact that we've done well in the past by things that haven't really impacted on individuals. But as we move to where we are now, we've actually got to engage far more with individuals and the choices that they make. And in our behaviour change report, we, we worked from the CCC figures to extrapolate that a third of all our um, net gain emission or our sort of greenhouse gas emissions by 2035 will have to come from individuals, how they heat their home or what they eat or what they buy. 
Do you have any confidence that politicians, given this area is fraught with political ideology, is going to make the progress that we need to do in the time frame that it must? Well, I think politicians have first of all got to remember that, that, that there is a distinction between the nanny estate and giving people the information so that they can make, um, make proper choices. I mean, I'm a conservative and I believe that people should have choice. But if you're going to have choice, you ought to know the facts. And, and, and therefore, one of the things I find most depressing about the government's uh, way of doing things is that it has not had a public information uh, campaign to explain to people even about its own offers, like the boiler um, scrappage scheme and other things, which people don't know about. Um, it hasn't learnt the lesson of the Warm Homes uh, campaign, which is that people need to know what they need for their own home and they need also to be sure that they don't have a cowboy builder. There are all sorts of things that you can do which is not the nanny state, it's enabling people to make decisions. Now when it comes to food, um, it surely is not a, um, it's not a controversial thing to say that we all eat too much. Um, I have seen what the health people tell me about meat we're not asking people to do what they do. What we're saying is that if we ate between 20 and 30% less meat, it would be very much better for us, and particularly if we ate better meat. And that is the choice we have. We ought to be eating pasture-fed meat. We need um, animals on our farms to get the balance, and I declare an interest as a small organic farmer. We, we need the animals on the farm to have the mixed uh, uh, production. They not only provide um, shit, but they also walk in a way which has very great importance about producing the, uh, um, uh, pro producing the uh, crops that we want. Um, and that's why I've always said to vegans, you, I'm happy for you to be a vegan, but don't tell everybody that that's the answer to climate change. It isn't, actually. And I don't like people climbing on the climate change man banner to try to press their own case. But, but the, the point is, yeah. it isn't unreasonable for the government, actually, as we're moving in that direction anyway, uh, the government to help people to know, for example, what sort of meat is healthily produced, <laughs> proper labelling, helping people to make those choices. It's very good for the farming community. Um, the British beef has the lowest carbon footprint in the world. We should be celebrating that and saying that and not saying, well, it'd be, it, it's sort of nanny stating. It isn't. It's, it's trying to help people who haven't had the opportunities that some of us have had to know these things, just to have the information. I just would like the government to be prepared to do that. And that's all it needs to do. It seems to me pretty simple. Um, but again, I'm afraid, uh, and, and this is why I was very direct with Lord Lilly, that the people who stop it are the people who really don't, in the end, realise the urgency of, of all this. And that's what I'm trying very hard. Optimistic I am, but urgent I'm desperate about, because if we don't get this right, then my optimism will be false, and I would hate to have misled people. Thank you. Lord Lucas. Oh, did you want to come in on this, John? Not on this subject, oh, but okay. just a subject of the progress report. Okay, if it's on the progress report, fine. Just very quickly. It is obviously, I've often wondered about electrification, uh, because obviously the push towards electrification puts great pressure on the grid to deliver that increased capacity to every corner of the UK is a huge challenge. Uh, is it a failure to invest likely then to undermine progress on other areas because of that lacking of infrastructure? Should it be prioritised? And I'm not even sure the size of the task has been properly identified. Well, I feel very strongly about this, and I'm very sad about it. And part of it is, of course, that when I answered uh, your question about the the fact that so much of the progress we have have been things that people have have had in a, in a curious way since done to them, so to speak. It's what the government has done. This is one thing the government should have done much earlier, because it was always obvious that the the grid, after all, was created in order to put out electricity from a relatively small number of generating points. And the French have this rather good word for that, the centrale, it was exactly what it was. 
Now we have a very large number of generating points putting stuff into the grid. It's a different mechanism. So first of all, the grid needs very fundamental rethinking in that sense. Secondly, we need to carry stuff, and we've got to think so much more seriously. I declare an interest because I live in Suffolk, but I do live quite a long way from the sea coast, so I'm not really um, uh, involved. But it does seem to be pretty silly to be bringing onshore um, a, a, a series of points from offshore instead of having an undersea cable which would take it all the way round. Instead of that, you are putting it onshore and then putting more um, overhead pylons. It's not surprising that people get a bit upset about it. And, um, Lord Bruce, we've disagreed about that, but I do really think that wherever you can make it easy for people to accept, we, we really do have to do that. Yes. And, and I can't understand why we've got this very old-fashioned view about the grid. We've got to have a very very new way of doing it. Wales is a very good example of this. In Wales, they want to put the, 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 the line, as I understand it, I was told when I was last in Wales, they want to put it round the coast, which, um, surprising they can do it there, but can't do it in the east of England, but that's what they want to do. Now, in Wales, actually, there's a very big argument for putting it actually across Wales, because so many farms are ill-served by electricity, will need it in the future. And, and I just want these things to be taken into account. We've only just had the appointment of somebody to be in charge of it. I mean, literally, a, a, a few months ago, why why was that not done a very long time ago? Because we all knew it. Um, and we've only just made the changes in, in national grid, which were very necessary because uh, the way it was privatised was not satisfactory as far as this is concerned, but the government has very rightly made those changes. But we really ought to get on with it now. Lucas. How can the government collaborate more effectively uh, with and support partners uh, to deliver net zero, including individuals, local government, businesses, civil society, and international partners? Well, I would start, thank you for that question, I, I would start with local authorities. I mean, we really do have to forge a partnership with local authorities mm. on this issue. And I have to say, it's not, this is not a criticism of the government, as a matter of fact. Um, when I was Secretary of State all those years ago for the environment, I found that whenever you wanted to devolve power, um, the civil service would end up by saying, better not, Minister. Um, they might get it wrong. <coughs> and and uh, my own view is that, of course, some of them will get it wrong, and there's some pretty bad examples like Thurrock and Croydon and, and, and Woking at this moment, and mm. all three political parties are involved in, 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 in this. So, I want, you know, this is not a party political comment at all. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we are, most of this stuff, not most, a good deal of this stuff can only be done on a local level through the local authority. And we've got to get a better relationship. It's got to be a partnership. And we're beginning to do it in some places. The government seems to me to have done much better with uh, 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 Manchester and with uh, Teesside. There's a, a beginning to do that. But we've got to get much better at working with local authorities to deliver. Local authorities, of course, have got to be much more willing to share that too. I once spoke to the Local Authorities Association and I said how much I didn't believe in anything being done in Brussels that couldn't be done in Westminster, but I wanted things done in Brussels because that's the only place we could do some things. I wanted nothing done in Westminster that couldn't be done in County Hall, and I got cheered. And then I said nothing in County Hall that couldn't be done in the District Council, and I got cheered. And then I said nothing done in the District Council which couldn't be done in the Parish Council, and they booed me because, <laughs> because, because it wasn't them. Yes. <laughs> what we have to do is, this is, this is a partnership, and we've really got, there's many things that the Parish Council could can really do in a locality and, and to, to get local uh, people working together. They can be the conduit for, for that. So uh, your point is absolute as far as local authorities and, and, and administration is concerned. We can work much more closely uh, with all sorts of people. I mean, the churches, both the Church of England and the Catholic Church, are doing uh, proportionately more than anybody else in reaching net zero. They have proper programs. They are, now, they need to be helped with their schools. 
Uh, there need to be a better relationship so that their schools, which are a quarter of the children in Britain go to, to go to um, uh, denominational schools, we, 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 we need to help them, I don't mean with money, but, but with easing the way. A silly example, but we'll explain what I mean. In France, schools are provided with um, shading for the hot weather in their car parks. And on the top of that, they put in um, photovoltaic cells. And the electricity is then used to power the school. Now, the Treasury in this country won't allow you to do that, uh, even though private enterprise and localities would want to do it. Uh, there's technical reasons why they won't allow you to do it. You can't borrow, the, in effect, borrow the money for that to be done. Now, those are the changes we need to make so that people can do sensible things in a way which is much more... Now, they, I know this because the Department of Education is pressing the Treasury to change those rules so that that sort of thing can be done. Internationally, well, I've tried to say that you mustn't resile on what you said. You mustn't go back on what you said. And we are in a difficult position. I mean, the absolutely disgraceful decision to cut our overseas aid from 0.7 to 0.5 uh, didn't help and doesn't help. Um, for rich countries, when they're in a bit of a mess, to take it out on poor countries is, <coughs> I think, just unacceptable. But we can build back on this, and we have to build back on it. And one of the things we have to do is actually to be a bit le less... Um, Great Britain this and Great Britain that, and a bit more, can we do it together? Just a bit more willing to learn from other people. A bit more cooperative, because that's how you get things done. You may still think that you're better, but don't tell them that. Just try to do it with them. And the last uh, issue about institutions, businesses. Business needs to feel confident that you're going to stick to what you say. And one of the biggest problems we have with this government and previous ones is that they haven't made it clear and stuck to it. If business knows that they're going to stick to it, business will do the investment. If they're unsure, then they won't. That's the biggest thing government can do to give confidence that what it is doing, it will go on doing, and sometimes it will do the less good rather than making the change, which only makes things more difficult. Thank you. I find that very optimistic. I, was, uh, I am <laughs> optimistic. I told you. <laughs> Look forward to your company in the uh, lobby on the local energy amendment when it comes back to us. Uh, but look at, to keep taking business in particular, uh, you know, it's not in the car industry's interest but to persuade us to use smaller cars. It's not in um, Oakley's interest to make their milk cheaper than, than cow's milk. How, do, how does one, in, under those circumstances, and you were mentioning the, the failure of the oil and gas companies to, uh, to, to really make their production as green as they can. Under those circumstances, what sort of levers should government be using? Well, one, one shouldn't be. <laughs> There's no one answer to this, but uh, when I started my business 25 years ago about sustainability, I started it because it seemed to me that very often doing the right thing was the way to profit. That very often what you have to do is to help people see that there is a, an advantage in it for them in terms of uh, using less energy, using less water, using less to make more. Uh, actually, that's better for business. Um, avoiding future restrictions is better for business. Doing things in the business timing rather than being forced by the government, all that's better for business. So there are many areas where we can help people look further forward and see that it is an advantage. That's very hard because it's not, that's very often not the people running the business, but the shareholders who are looking at quarterly returns and the results. So we, this is, again, partly a, a need for certainty so that they can point to the fact that they're going to have to do it in that way because this is happening, and partly government supporting them publicly as to the direction in which they want them to go. Um, of course, there are some times where you just have to change 
the commercial realities. And there are a whole series of areas where we have failed to do that. Um, we could, for example, make large motor cars using a great deal of energy, more expensive proportionately than small motor cars. We can make, there is some distinction, but we could make that much sharper. We could make it much more expensive uh, to fly a private airline. We've got more private flights, I understand, in Britain than any other country, apart from the United States. I think we could make that much more expensive. Mm. We could make it cheaper to go to uh, Edinburgh by train and more expensive by air. We could do those things. And we could do what I said about um, plugging in your motor car. Why are we charging VAT on that when we don't charge it on the energy in our own home? That is not sensible. There are a whole series of things that we can do. And if, if you reduce our intake of money for the Treasury by what I'm suggesting on VAT, then wouldn't the best way of doing that would be to increase the charge on SUVs? It's all mm. possible. Can I follow up on that point you made about the Pope? Because when Lord Rees spoke in a recent debate in the Lords on our behaviour change, report, he made the case for why we need more secular popes on climate change. We've obviously got David Attenborough, and you've mentioned the Pope, uh, who's made some very strong and powerful comments on climate change. But what we need is a few more business people, more secular popes standing up to the charge. And it does seem to me that in recent years, some of the strong voices that we saw in the past, like uh, chief executives of Unilever, to name but one, there's not that strong business voice, those secular popes that we need in this space. So as you've stepped down from the Climate Change Committee and we're moving into a delivery phase for climate change, I'm not asking you to give advice to the government about who should be your successor, but I would like your views on, on the absence of strong secular popes in the business community speaking up for climate change action. Well, there are some, and we should uh, honour them. I mean, Mark Carney is one, for example, um, uh, until he uh, retired. Paul Polman was another. There are a whole range of people who do uh, come. So I don't want to underestimate the real contribution that those people have made. I mean, uh, uh, the chairman of Iceland, for example, um, is uh, particularly good in, in what... I mean, so there are a series of people who, who do do this. I come back to the point, um, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, I, I come back to this central point about trying to get people to understand that it is their individual personal responsibility as well as their business. You know, people hide under the basis, I am the chairman of this company. Now, I'll tell you about the company, but I don't see myself as being in this. I, I want every chairman to think to himself, I'm going to have to answer, because they are. They are going to have to answer, and they're going to have to answer some of the toughest questions that grandparents are going ever to be asked, is why didn't you do what could have stopped this? And, and, and I therefore think if we need to make them feel that they need to make this contribution. And I don't think we've done that satisfactorily. And I'm all for secular popes, if you see what I mean. I, 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 only, use, I only use that book because uh, I only recommend it was because a friend of mine who was an atheist and one of the great climate uh, 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 scientists said to me once, uh, if you really want to understand it, that's the best thing to understand. As he's an atheist, I thought it was well, well worth quoting in that sense. Very good. Thank you. Uh, um, following up on Baroness Palmer's question about business, I mean, in the last few weeks, we've had knockbacks on, I mean, I'm thinking of three specific amendments, one on the repeal of the EU laws, which John Krebs tried to get in a, you know, a non-regression on environmental law. I did one about not having finance going towards illegal deforestation, not just legal forestation. And Helene Heyman was trying to get a nature clause. And what it seems to be we see is massive deregulation happening. How, how is that in any way compatible? I mean, does this depress you? Well, I, I think 
I think there's another problem which I can say to a select committee of the House of Lords, and that is that this government and previous governments, ever since uh, actually ever since uh, Tony Blair's government, really haven't come to the terms with with the fundamental change in Parliament which we have to recognise. Uh, I have to say this carefully because I don't want to sound um, uh, like an old man looking back, but I have to say, when I first got into Parliament, which was in 1970, uh, members of Parliament had much more power over the executive. Mm. The opposition had control over the timetable. Yeah. Uh, every bill was debated in committee for at least 100 hours, so that we really were a revising chamber as well, and the House of Lords was a, a, an additional revising chamber. Now, bills are not discussed. Uh, they come to the House of Lords without yeah. detailed discussion. And the government doesn't seem to recognise that very often the discussion and the motion, the, the, the amendments are nothing to do with politics or people. It just is to make sense of what they have put forward. And my problem with it is that until the government is prepared to accept those things, which they say, particularly things when they say, you don't need this because it's already covered. Yes. Well, that is not an argument. Indeed. If you don't need it and it's already covered, then accept it and let it be there because there are a number of people who think that it isn't properly covered. Do that. And so I think part of the problem is that we have got to, when they talk about the reform of the House of Lords, I want reform of Parliament so that we have, because the the fact is that the power of the executive has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished. And, and this is a hugely important role for us to deal with. Then, having put it in that context, then um, I have to say, I think the unwillingness of the government to put into law what they say as ministers is not right. Yeah. And I think it's particularly true for a government that must be recognising that perhaps it won't be the government after the next election. I would be saying, I'd better put this into law because you never know what the next lot might do. It seems to me a very good excuse for doing this. Um, and uh, I'm sure the next lot, whoever they might be, would be then restricted in some way. I'm not sure it is actually as... In other words, I think it's much more the cock-up than, the, than the, the plot. I don't think it's because people don't want more regulation because they're saying, this is what we're going to do. So it, it, it can't be that. It is an unwillingness ever to think that someone else might have an idea which you haven't covered. You've always got to say no. I want a government that says a lot more yes. yes. When I was Secretary of State, I used to say to the wonderful um, uh, Freddie Howe, who was my Minister of State all those years ago, I used to say to him, these are the five things I need in this Act. These are the ten things I'd like to have. If you have to give way on anything else, give way, because we've got to get this through. I wish that's how government work now, because you get better laws. We've got very bad laws, bad laws because they're not properly debated, and because the because the executive demands powers, which it should never have, and people in the past wouldn't have allowed it. That's a hugely strong mm -hmm. case for the House like, of Lords. Right. <laughs> so can I ask you, there's a huge um, controversy really about planning at the moment and the need for housing and so forth. And there's equally a problem for environmental pressure, water, water supply. And do we need a radical overhaul uh, on climate change basis um, to try and deliver? Because at the moment, we're just bumbling along with some people saying, let the developers do it, and other people are opposing it. And in every case, it seems to me the developments are not really meeting the sort of environmental standards we're looking for. So what, what should we do? Well, I think, and, and we've said this, I, I think we should have... Um, an addition to the, um, the, the planning law, which is an overarching one, which says that no planning permission should be given or refused without fully taking into account uh, the government's commitments to net zero in 2050 and the other statutory situations. Um, I'm told by the lawyers, because I put this to um, one of their chambers only yesterday, that you need to say that and have a bit of an addition to make it work. But roughly speaking, that's what you have to do. 
Um, and that means that you don't get yourself into vast quantities of changes of planning law. And you will remember, Lord Bruce, that, that actually planning law takes longer and is more acrimonious and more determined than almost any other law. So I think that's what I would do immediately. And that would then enable people to make decisions sensibly um, at every level. The other bit I do think is true is we, we really ought to look at the economic realities. No house builder wants to build on brownfield sites. They want the easy build on a greenfield site. So unless you make it easier for them to do the one which you want on brownfield sites and more difficult on the greenfield site, you won't get the houses that you've got. Also, we've got to face the fact that we have built, since the Conservative government in 2017 foolishly put off the net the zero house um, uh, plans, which the Labour Party had put into operation, mind you, a bit cynically, because they put it as far forward as they possibly could, I have to say, so I'm not really blaming either party, but that's what happened. The house builders have built a million and a half homes, which are not fit for, for mm. the future. And what that means is that they've taken the profit and handed the cost on to the people who bought the homes. Um, and when you think that one house builder offered their chief executive £140 million bonus, you will see uh, oh what is so wrong about this. Uh, I think the house builders really ought to pay for it myself. I think there ought to be a fund which they have to put into for every house that they have built within that way over the next year. But you can build homes that are fit for the future at the same price yeah. because the money comes out of the, 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 out of the cost of the land. That's what happens is you pay less for the land. But the house builders, of course, have now become land speculators. So they've all got large amounts of land. And so they don't want to make that change because they have paid a price which was about building crap houses and not building the houses we need. And I think the government's really got to face that. And there is no doubt about it, you have to say to house builders, you've got to meet proper standards. And if you've bought land at a price which, I'm afraid that's a, a cost you're going to have to carry. Uh, but in future, uh, you buy the land at a price which enables, because that's how you work out the land price. You say, how much am I going to sell the house for? Mm -hmm. And this is what it's going to cost me. And that's what I've got to pay to the local authority. And therefore, I can pay this much for the land. And that's what they will do if you set the targets. But we've got to set that and we're still waiting for them. Witty. Oh, and then Duke Westminster. Not Westminster. Not witty. Um, could, I, could I come back? Could I come to a subject we haven't touched on? Uh, you're still relying very substantially on, on behaviour change. We did a report on behaviour change, which we touched on this, but not very strongly. Behaviour change is driven by a lot of things, but uh, the messages which get to the ordinary consumer come largely through the advertising industry. Uh, and if you look, for example, at transport, most adverts, adverts for cars are for big gas costing cars. Most adverts for food are for food which is not good for you or for the planet. Um, do you feel that uh, a, a government campaign to counter that would probably fall on deaf ears because it is the government? Um, but do you think there is a role for greater regulation or self-regulation of the information that gets put across in the advertising industry in specific fields um, because otherwise uh, the behaviour change will be very slow to change. Yeah. I have to say that I think um, uh, there are different answers for different parts of the industry. Um, if I were in the food industry and I've been close to that and was really on the um, sector council and actually created the sector council in the sense of working out how we did it. Um, so I'm very close to the food industry. I think they've got a real issue that's coming up their way, which is ultra high processed um, food, where the evidence is mounting that this is serious mm. and that they're going to have to face it. And of course, most advertising is for ultra high processed food. I think they're going to have a real issue from the science, which is becoming clearer, it isn't certain, but any of you who haven't read uh, Chris Van Tonneken's book, Ultra High, High Process P, 
people really ought to do that. So I think there are pressures from the marketplace that are going to come. I just notice my family now looks much more carefully about what are the ingredients and buy bread, for example, which has the three likely ingredients, which are wheat, yeast and water rather than ones which have a whole list of things, including things you never thought were in bread, like rice flour and, and, and other ones that you don't actually understand. I think that move, so there, will, there are some areas where helping people to understand the choices they're making for health reasons, but again, I, I do want to help people to make their own choices. If they want to eat things which are not good for them, they must have the right to do so, but they must have the information to make those choices. And one of the problems is, and I do, I'm, I am a, I'm not in favour of any regulation we don't need, and I want good regulation rather than bad regulation. So I'm on that side and always have been, but I'm also conscious of the responsibility that all of us here have of being fortunate enough to be educated enough to know things which some people have not had that chance. And I just noticed that people who work with us in my businesses and, and, and at home and the rest of it, I notice that if you just happen to talk about things in a simple way, they, they say, oh gosh, I didn't really understand that. I didn't actually know that. Mm. We've got to find ways of, of helping them to do that. So I'm not a contrary advertising campaign, but giving people opportunities to choose. And I think that the supermarkets have really got to learn their role in this, and some of them are. Um, choice editing is uh, a curious phrase, but it's uh, not a bad not a bad thing, where you put things, how you help people to make proper decisions. Um, as far as the um, motor car industry is concerned, I think we're in an in-between stage, aren't we? I mean, they want to get rid of the cars that they won't be able to sell after uh, um, uh, 2030. I mean, I think there are, there are other reasons for, for, for pressing this. But I think the, the real answer there is that um, uh, you could make the market work better if uh, you made it uh, cheaper to buy the right car um, and less expensive uh, than it is now. And you'd still take the same amount of money in if you got that balance right. So I think we can do lots of things. I really do think the government tells you, sort of wartime statement, <laughs> it's not going to make any difference. It won't work. And we couldn't spend the money that uh, uh, some companies spend. Um, uh, I forgot to say about Oatly, by the way, um, uh, if you're going to have a dairy substitute, which I think is a mistake, but if you are going to have it, um, oat milk is the best one. You should never have almond milk or um, uh, soya milk, all of which are much worse for the environment than either dairy or oat milk. I merely make the point because I don't want people to fail to <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think, given we started this session early, uh, that it is, unless anyone has any burning last questions, you do. Well, I, Please do, Story Charles, because you I haven't asked a question describe it. I can but you hardly haven't describe it as burning. Um, uh, and of course, I must declare my agricultural interest, as I always do. But I was so pleased that you made a distinction between good meat and bad yeah. meat in the sense of pasture-fed versus intensive uh, farming, which has done so much damage to the environment in so many ways. Um, what a pity you're not continuing in your current role. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a, a great sadness, and I'm sure everyone around this table uh, admires your record um, in your role at the moment. Um, you are a member of the House of Lords. Um, um, if you were a member of this committee, what would you be recommending that we do next as a piece of work? Yeah. <laughs> That's the hardest question for because there, so, there are so many. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a thing that I really think would make a difference. Um, there are many incidental um, barriers to doing the right thing. Um, things which have arisen because of the way we used to do things. I mean, one of the reasons we can't have the, the pipe round the sea 
is because there are rules which were laid down in order to keep competition between different arrays, which, which don't really account now. Um, the point I made about the Treasury and the, um, uh, and, and, and the photovoltaic cells and a uh, whole set, there are many, many things that get in the way which people don't need to have, which there's no theological, philosophic, political reason for having. And no one has really looked at how do you make sure that those things are put right. I have a theory that if we had, instead of a better regulation committee or a deregulation committee, if we had a, 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 a properly run centre where anybody who found one of these could go and say, and it was duty bound to try to put it right and <laughs> raise it, I think we would make a huge difference. There are so many things that are in the way. And I wonder whether we couldn't um, do a, a bit of research on what the major ones of those and propose the changes which are administrative, legal, the sort of thing that the Law um, Commission does about laws, you know, that you look at where we are and what changes could be made administratively to make things easier. That's why I want what I've suggested for the um, planning thing. Things that don't cost indeed may indeed reduce I'm, I'm told that there are rules in scotland about small uh, this may have been overcome now but small um uh, turbines in water that make it more difficult that if you got rid of them people could do that and um, nobody is doing this because nobody feels it's big enough i think it's put it together it's huge and if the committee thought they could do something along those lines, they would be doing something no one else has done, and that must be a good thing. Um, could I come back, uh, Lord? I think there's more agreement between us than uh, your answer might have. But he might have thought we are both agreed that we don't want to reduce the supply of fossil fuels more rapidly than the demand for them, or we'll end up in a Putin situation, either in the UK or in the world as a whole. So your sole reason for limiting the supply of oil and gas and further development of oil and gas in the UK is so that we can, in some way, exercise more persuasion to stop African countries, for some reason, starting oil and gas industries. Is that it? No, uh, it is nearly it, but I want to agree with you, Lord Lilly, as we have known each other for longer than most people around this table, so I would like to agree with you. What I am saying is... The world has to reduce the amount of oil it's producing. The International Energy Authority has said that means that we should not be producing new sources of oil. Uh, there is real pressure from uh, the oil companies, particularly from very bad oil companies like ExxonMobil, who are unashamedly not doing anything to change their attitude, uh, to get countries to allow them to produce more oil from those countries. That is what is happening. Britain has been significantly successful in setting an example which other people have followed. To get net zero, when you think of the countries that Alok Sharma got on side, if you think of the work that was being done by previous governments, the fact of the matter is, we are influential. We can change it. And if you, therefore, don't, you say to the world, we are not going to be an addition to the production. We are going to go on using what we have to use on a declining basis. But what we are going to do is to speed up the switch from oil and gas to that much cheaper thing called renewable energy. And we'll do that, and at the same time, we'll help you to do it, which is why it's terribly important 
that we, because I can tell you, the Republican Party in America is busy trying to encourage African nations to take on more gas and oil. That, that is their policy. Their, their policy, it's particularly gas, because they say that's better for the environment as an excuse. So I have to say to you, Lord Elliot, there is a real issue here. People on the other side who don't care are trying to make these countries produce more or start to produce. We have to set that example. Otherwise, people only think that we're saying things and not doing them. And in a sense, the fact that it's hard, Lord Bruce, the fact that it's hard makes it credible. And I'm afraid we're going to have to do some hard things in order to achieve what, in the end, I come back to, is the urgent need to have a world in which our children will be able to grow up and live lives anything like the very, very fortunate lives all of us have lived. Thank you. Well, that's a very powerful place to end this session. I think we would all concur with the words of the Duke of Wellington that we all admire your record. You've been a champion redoubtable for net zero, and we look forward to the many um, years to come using the platforms here in the House and elsewhere that you have to carry on making the case. So with that, we thank you very sincerely, Lord Deben, and I close the meeting. Thank you. Very much. <clears throat>